as I noticed on my noted in my last video, the states that succeeded what came after the Romans left England and the Anglo Saxons eventually came here were noted for their endless little petty wars and sort of feuds with each other. It was quite some time before they became unified. Along the way to that, you had Christianity as a sort of backdrop to that. And along with people like Patrick being kidnapped to go to Ireland and be a slave, you had a reverse direction. You had a load of evangelical figures popping over from Ireland, such as St. Aidan and loads of other people. Now, I'm not going to do a whole pod history of evangel figure, figures like that going over to places like Northumbria and the north of England and Scotland and so on, as it would take hours and hours, and only the most diehard people would have a really interest in it. But if you ever wondered about why you have Easter on particular at a particular day, you may find the following presentation quite funny. And it, it's quite funny, the fighting this caused about something that today, in a more secular age, people will be like, don't really care. Um, here you have the Synod of Whitby. How the Synod of Whitby settled the date of Easter. The dates of our Easter holiday may seem too hard to predict from year to year. But in 7th century England, things were even more confusing. There was no agreement among Christian groups on when to celebrate Easter. And it became the subject of heated discussion. It still is, by the way. I'll get back to that a little bit later. A landmark meeting known to us as the Synod of Whitby, Christian missionaries gathered at Whitby Abbey to put forward their respective arguments, and a formula was finally settled upon. The one that we still use today to determine the date of Easter. Discover what the formula is based on and how the Synod reached its decision almost 1,400 years ago. Discover also how monks can beat each other up over this. A movable feast. The Christian feast of Easter commemorates Christ's suffering and death on the cross, Good Friday, and his resurrection three days later, Easter Sunday. The Gospels tell us this happened during the Jewish festival of the Passover. Just as an aside, outside of English-speaking countries, Easter is rarely called that. It's normally called something derived from Pascha for the Paschal season. For example, in other countries, you'll find like Ireland, Easter is Kaska which is a variation on it. The date of the Passover is determined by the lunar cycle, the calendar of the monthly cycle of the moon. The early Christian church adopted this lunar calculation for the date of Easter. In the early 4th century, it was agreed that Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday must be celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. This seems simple enough. However, there was disagreement about the date of the spring equinox, the day of the lunar month on which it was permissible for Easter Sunday to fall, and even the day of, hour of the day when Easter Sunday began. Different traditions, each capable of appealing to well-established precedent, had their own methods for calculating the date of Easter. In the middle of the 7th century, two such traditions came to head in the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria. In the 5th century, Germanic peoples, the Anglo-Saxons, invaded and settled in what would be the Roman province of Britannia. These invaders did not share the Christian beliefs of many people in late Roman Britain. They were subsequently pushed to the rest and fringes of the British Isles. Starting in the late 16th, 6th century, efforts were made to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. In 597, Moke, by Pope Gregory the Great in Rome, arrived on the shores of Kent under the leadership of St. Augustine. There's a famous story about him and sort of um, calling Anglo-Saxons Angles, which some older viewers may be aware of. They established a base at Canterbury and gradually spread the Christian message across the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Irish monks feared their monastery I own off the western shores of Scotland undertook a simultaneous and quite independent campaign of conversion. And this is where you get a problem because the Irish monks and the Roman monks had different ways of doing this and were influenced by different traditions. Northumbria, area, then the dominant Anglo-Saxon kingdom, was Christianized from the 1620s onwards by both Roman and Irish missionaries. But the Roman and Irish traditions had different practices, particularly in their ways of calculating the date of Easter. This celebrity led to disagreements about when Easter should be kept, which even extended to the royal household. Osri, king of Northumbria, between 654 and 670, became a Christian under the influence of Irish monks. 
However, his wife, King Enflid, was from Kent and followed Roman practices. One year, the Queen was happily celebrating Easter Sunday while his wife was still keeping her austere length and fast and observing Palm Sunday. And you could imagine that caused great joy between the married couple. The Synod of Whitby, since Easter is the pivotal event in the Christian calendar, these issues were not just inconvenient. Some Northumbrian nobles began to wonder if they had made a mistake in adopting the Christian faith. As B, the great history or in of the conversion, the Anglo Saxons put it, this dispute radically began to trouble the minds and conscience of many people who fear that they might have received the name of Christian in vain. In 664, Oswy decided to settle the matter once and for all by calling a meeting of leading churchmen and nobles at the monastery he had founded at Whitby, which was then governed by his kinswoman, Abbess Hild, later St. Hild, who's a fascinating figure herself. We know this meeting as a synod of Whitby. Coleman, Bishop of Lindisfarne and lately, later of Mustard, presented the Irish case with Wilfred of Northumbrian, who had travelled to the continent and was now Abbot of Ripon, speaking for the Roman side. Each appealed to traditions established by Christ's apostles. Coleman said he was following the practice of St. John, maintained by the Irish missionary St. Columba of Iona. Wilfred called upon the authority of St. Peter. When Oswald asked who was the gatekeeper of heaven, he quoted Christ's own words in the Gospel of St. Matthew. You are Peter, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of heaven I shall not prevail against it. And to you I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. As Coleman could not cite similar authority of succession, Oswald decided the Roman practice should prevail. But B reported that all those present, high and low, agreed with the decision, though Coleman and a few followers refused to conform to where Roman practice is reduced to Iona. You'll also find other reports of this in historical sources saying um, all agreeing was a bit overly optimistic and that fist fighting broke out. I'm doing this presentation to show that there's an interchange of cultures going on there. The Irish, who were originally, of course, themselves non-Christian, had Patrick go over there. He wasn't, by the way, the first Christian to reach them. There were other Christian missionaries before them, but not many of them were not particularly successful. They then re-exported Christianity backwards, but their Christianity was influenced more by a, a model from the Desert Fathers and what amusingly nowadays would be considered models more in line with perhaps Eastern Orthodoxy or the asceticism of that faith. That clashed later on to some degree with the, with the practice of um, Christians coming over from Rome. At the bottom, this, this article makes the amusing point, and it's possibly a good point, that you could see this as a forerunner of events like the Reformation where two churches clashed. You could also, as it points out, though, say, say that that's not absolutely the case and that essentially the Roman, Irish and Roman missionaries share the same fundamental belief. You will find people trying to borrow this event in, in British history today to suggest that the ancient Irish were um, essentially Eastern Orthodox. I think that's a simplistic view to take on this highly debated topic. But it does show that there is a, an interculture or exchange going on all the time in British history over this. And then what Patrick brought to Ireland was repurposed and sent back to England, to the Anglo-Saxons. And the Irish were certainly regarded as a learned nation in this era, where people learned from many of their teachers and many of the saints and scholars who came forth from it. It would be nice if, when people presented these sort of topics about medieval history, they included some context like this. I know it's difficult in five or ten minute YouTube videos to do so, but it's not impossible. And it's not impossible to treat the listener of the videos as if they have a brain and wish to learn something. I'm going to include some links about this, this video, this little article I'm reading, and an article about the saint as well. Perhaps someone will want to read it. Yes, it's a minority interest subject, but better if people, a few people read it and enlarge their minds than if no one knows it.